open our hearts to the Lord and pray. Our loving and merciful God, we praise and thank you for the bountiful blessings you have given us. Thank you for giving us a mind that can know and a heart that can love. Thank you for giving us a chance to continue worshiping you amidst the pandemic and the world's troubles. We ask forgiveness for the times we have failed you. Father, help us stay focused on today's teachings, and may we be able to use this knowledge to make a difference in the lives of the people around us. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Let us all stand and worship. We continue to worship God by keeping His Word in our minds and hearts. This week's memory verse is found in Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11. For this reason also, God highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2 verses 9 to 11. Let's make it a habit to memorize scripture. Good day, everyone, and welcome back to our series entitled, It Is Not About You. You probably know by now that this whole series is about worship, and worship is all about God. It's all about Jesus. Last Sunday, Pastor Jim Welchel reminded all of us that we are wired for worship, meaning to say something in us will compel us to worship something or someone, including ourselves. But he also reminded us that only Jesus is worthy of your worship and mine. So it's really not about you. Now, I'd like to bring us to the subtitle of our series theme. Remember, it's not about you. But we have a subtitle here which may have gone unnoticed until now. So let me blow it up for you and let's discuss that today. The subtitle is How Worship Transforms Man and Exalts God. How does that happen? How does worship transform man and exalt God? Well, let me ask you, are there things in your life that you would like to see changed? I'm sure the answer is yes, but chances are you're probably thinking about circumstances in your life that you would like to see changed. For example, you would like to see an end to this pandemic or maybe you're facing other challenges and issues in your life and you'd like to see them resolved. Those are perfectly legit. I totally understand that. But I'd like to submit to you today that the most important change, the most critical transformation that needs to take place is inside you and inside me. And it begins with worship. And who is the only one worthy of our worship? That's right. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. So how does worship transform man and eventually exalt God? Let me illustrate. Have you ever noticed how we tend to imitate people whom we truly admire? That's true. Let me illustrate this through two of my four wonderful grandchildren. Here is one of them. He's two years old. He's behind the wheel of their family car. And why is he so excited to be there? Because he admires his dad so much and his dad is an excellent driver. Now here's my seven-year-old granddaughter. She's not pretending to cook. She is actually making breakfast for the family at seven years old. What inspires her to do this? Well, she admires her mom very much. And her mom is an excellent cook. And here are both of them behind their laptops, working hard, just the way they see their parents, whom they admire, working very hard. Now, don't be too impressed. These are not real laptops. They're just made out of cardboard. But that's the whole point. 
Now, this phenomenon of imitating people whom we truly admire is not limited just to young children. It happens in adults as well. For example, I recall one of my former bosses. He was then a vice president. And he had a tremendous admiration for the president and chief executive officer of our company at that time. And he had very good reasons to be in great admiration of this man. We, the staff, were observing our vice president. And this is what we observed and we concluded it was related to his great admiration of our president. Our vice president would often dress up just like the president. When our vice president would stand up and speak before a crowd, we noticed he sounded almost exactly like the president. But wait, there's more. He even had the favorite ice cream flavor, the same favorite ice cream flavor as our president. Now, there's nothing wrong with following the good example of role models in our lives. But I submit to you, the best possible role model by far that we should pattern our lives after is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, you and I are not meant just to admire Jesus. We are meant to worship Him. And so the title of our message today is this. Worship Jesus, be transformed. What is the connection between worshiping and being transformed? Worshiping Jesus in spirit and truth, in authentic worship, and our lives being transformed. Well, the Bible tells us what the connection is. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is what we read. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. It says, present your bodies. And obviously, when we present our bodies, we present everything else that comes along with it our mind, our will, our emotions. In other words, worship is our total and complete devotion to Jesus Christ as our Lord, our Master, and our Savior. Now, where is the transformation part? Verse 2 tells us, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In other words, we now, in our worship of Jesus, have the opportunity and even the divine capability of no longer conforming to the sinful patterns of this world, but instead being transformed. That's where we get the word metamorphosis. If you remember your, your high school biology, and it says we are able to renew our mind because when we change the way we think, we also change the way that we live. And that means our lives will be more aligned with the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I know that's a lot to take in at this moment. So allow me to kind of express in my own words my appreciation of this principle of how worship transforms you and me. Here it is. The more we worship Jesus, the more we know and love Him. The more we know and love Him, the more we want to please Him and to obey Him. And as a result, the more we become like Him. Now, becoming more like Jesus is not about external appearance, obviously. Although that does remind me of an amusing incident that took place in my life many, many years ago when my hair and my beard were much thicker and darker. I was driving out in the province with my family, and I was stopped by a traffic enforcer, actually three of them. And they said I had a violation, and I did not argue. I gave them my license. And so there they were a few meters away, and they were huddling, discussing. And one of them kept looking back at me and smiling. Then they'd talk some more, and then he'd look back at me and smile. And eventually, that one guy came back to the car, gave me back my license, and said to me, Sir, it's okay. 
we will let you go. Anyway, you look like Jesus. Now, that is not what we mean by becoming more like Jesus. We're talking about becoming more like him in our character. Do you know that it is God's design and God's desire that you and I become more like Jesus? We see that, for example, in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the likeness or the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. This is God's desire and design for you and me to become more and more like Jesus in character. But obviously, it's not an automatic thing. You and I have a role to play. We have a responsibility in this transformation. And in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, we're told, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. In other words, if you and I claim to be in a relationship with Jesus and we share the gospel with people, the walk in our life must match the talk of our mouth. You know, a former boss of mine had this amazing principle, and I, I want to see if you actually agree. Fill in the blanks, please. People listen with their what? Most of you will automatically say people listen with their ears. But actually, people listen more with their eyes. And that's why if you and I are going to represent Jesus and tell people about him, again, our walk needs to match our talk. And what would be the greatest motivation for us to imitate the character of Jesus? Jesus himself gave us the answer. In John 14, verse 15, he says, If you love me, you will obey or you will keep my commandments. Which brings us to our outline for today. Remember, the message is, worship Jesus, be transformed. Our outline for today is this. Worship, first of all, is all about practicing the presence of Christ. It's more than just singing two or three songs to him on a Sunday. It is consciously practicing his presence through our time of prayer with him, solitude, reading his word, allowing him to speak to our hearts. All of these are part of worship. And as we experience the blessing of worshiping Jesus, it allows us to see what's important to his heart. And that will allow us to be united in Christ, united behind his purpose, his mission, of having more and more people in this world get to know him as Lord and Savior. But again, we said that the message is critical, but the messenger is also important. So you and I need to be more and more humble like Christ. And in the end, the objective is for his exaltation so that more people from throughout this world will worship Jesus as their Lord and Savior. All of these things that I just described are found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And so that will be our passage for today. So let's begin. What is it about the presence of Jesus that is such a great blessing and is able to transform our perspective about life? Paul begins in Philippians chapter 2 by saying this. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion. You know, as you and I practice the presence of Christ, as we have our personal time of authentic worship of Him, these are some of the blessings we experience. For example, encouragement consolation, fellowship with him. We experience his affection and his compassion. Let me give you an example of how that was true in my own life. Many of you may know that I lost my dear wife, Agnes, to COVID last April. We'd been married for 36 and a half years. A few weeks after I lost her was also a few weeks after I had been discharged from the hospital also for COVID. 
I felt like my life was turned upside down. I didn't know what my future was going to be. But as I was walking around the second floor of our house, just having a private time with Jesus, he gave me tremendous encouragement and consolation. It's something I didn't even expect, but I was so happy to receive. He reminded me that my wife, who had so many, so many physical, so many medical issues throughout many years of her life, was now enjoying perfection, joy, and peace in heaven. And there was one particular thing that came through my mind. It was dancing. Now, I didn't dance, but I remembered my wife always loved to dance, except that she was so frustrated because I, I'm probably one of the world's worst dancers. And more seriously, in the last year or two of her life, she already had trouble walking. What more dancing? But then I had the image that in the presence of Jesus, she was now dancing to her heart's content. It's really amazing how worship can transform us, transform our perspective about our circumstances. Let me tell you another story of how this happens. This involves one of our members in one of the CCF satellites in the West Coast. A few weeks ago, this lady, this member of CCF in the West Coast told me the sad news that her sister had gotten really sick and eventually had passed away. But how did God console her and transform her perspective? Our member was sharing with me that weeks or even months before that, she had started a go viral study group with all of her siblings. And of course, her sister was part of that Bible study group. Now, one time, none of her siblings could make it except the sister. So she had a wonderful one-on-one -on -one time with her sister. She was able to remind her about how much Jesus loves her and how she needed to recommit her life to Jesus. And from that day forward until the day she passed away, the sister was consistently tuning in to the online worship services of CCF. And that brings me to the next point in our outline. As we are blessed in our personal worship of Jesus, it should serve to unite us as we see more and more of the heart of Jesus. What is his priority becomes our priority. And that's why the Apostle Paul said in the next verse, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, meaning love for God, love for others, united in spirit, literally being of one soul. And here's the most important thing, intent on one purpose. What is that one purpose that we should be united behind? And that obviously is telling more and more people about Jesus and helping them grow in a personal and worshipful relationship with him. Paul said, make my joy complete. But you know who else? will be truly joyful, exalted, and glorified when Christians are united in that purpose? It's Jesus. And that's why worship transforms man and exalts God. Look at what Jesus prayed for you and for me 2,000 years ago. In John 17, this was part of Jesus' prayer. He says, I'm not asking on behalf of these alone, meaning I'm not just praying, Father, for these 12 men. I'm also praying for those who believe in me through their word, meaning to say extended down through the centuries. This includes you and me. Jesus was praying for you and for me 2,000 years ago. And what was his desire? His desire was that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Ultimately, what is the goal? so that the world may believe that you sent me. That is the heart of Jesus, that more and more people throughout this world will know him and worship him in spirit and in truth. What, after all, is the CCF mission? By the way, just a reminder, this month is also Missions Month, and next Sunday 
is going to be our anniversary service. So everyone, invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors to tune in for a very special worship service with Pastor Peter as we celebrate the amazing faithfulness of God over 37 years. Now, having said that, I go back to our mission. The CCF mission is to honor God. It really begins with worship. And as an outflow of that worship, we want to make Christ-committed followers who will make Christ-committed followers. Because indeed, worship transforms man and exalts God. Worship Jesus and be transformed. Last week, Pastor Jim mentioned that by the grace of God, we have 46 CCF international satellites, meaning CCF churches outside of the Philippines. And the Lord has raised up a particular person to help oversee these 46 international satellites, of course, with the help of other servant leaders from regions throughout the world. This man is a longtime friend of mine, and I'd like to introduce you to him. His name is Pastor Danny Perez, and here he is with his wonderful wife, Grace. Together, Pastor Danny and his wife, Grace, are helping CCF members from throughout the world to be united behind the cause of Christ, to help other people know him, to have a personal relationship with him, and to worship him as their Lord and Savior. But they also understand that just as important as the message is the messenger. And so Pastor Danny and Grace, along with the other servant leaders on their team, are helping people from all over the world become humble like Christ. Because after all, it's all about becoming more like Him. And when they help people become humble like Christ, these are the passages that they use. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. Let me read them for you before I turn you over to Pastor Danny. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. These are the verses that Pastor Danny and Grace and our international leaders use to help people become more and more humble like Jesus. So, friends, please welcome for his personal testimony, as well as some other wonderful stories of transformation, Pastor Danny Perez. As intentional disciples, we defined Christ-likeness or being transformed into the image of Christ as humility. And this is the humility that the Apostle Paul clearly described in Philippians 2, 3 to 8. And we made Christ-like humility the end goal of our intentional discipleship or ID in ourselves and in our disciples. Intentional discipleship is really modeling 24-7, a lifestyle of Christ-like humility to others, family first. And we are intentional to make sure that Christ-like humility is evident and we measure it to see it happening in our lives. Let me now share with you how we practice um, intentional discipleship. My wife and I first memorize Philippians 2, 3 to 8, word for word, to recite and apply it daily. This is a daily, uh, constant reminder of God's purpose for us. It's a repetition of God's purpose. And this is consistent Christ-likeness leading to successful witnessing. And not only that, we make sure that we assess our progress with accountability. And we do that by personalizing Philippians 2, 3 to 8. Let me share with you what that is. Philippians 2, 3 to 8 personalized. You know, in our discipleship, before we start our intentional discipleship, like couples to couples, 
and then uh, couples with their children for accountability and then a single leader with his parents. What we do is we make them recite Philippians 2, 3 to 8 in a personalized way. And let me show you how to recite Philippians 2, 3 to 8 in a personalized way. Something like this. I do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard grace and my children as more important than myself. I do not only look out for my own personal interests, but for the interests of grace and my children. I have this attitude in myself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You know what? After our ID sessions, after we personalized Philippians 2, 3 to 8, humility, um, we realized that humility is the key to obedience to all. And it's the key to authentic transformation. And I mean authentic transformation. Transformation that is not lip service or hypocritical. And we make sure that we are true to what we say because we practice intentional discipleship with true accountability. We, we do reality checks, so to speak. So what do we do? My wife and I, um, after um, all of our ID sessions, uh, she would usually ask me, are we practicing what we preach? And of course, that will make me think to be honest and sometimes be uncomfortable about it. But these are good questions. So we and our disciples, we ask difficult questions to measure transformation in our um, intentional discipleship. Questions like, have I been selfish? And proud to you? How can I improve to be Philippians 2, 3 to 8, humble to you daily? You know, these are difficult questions, but questions that we need to ask nevertheless. And then we make a list of all the conflicts that we have in our families, like husband and wife conflict, parents, children conflict. Uh, we ask these of our disciples to be able to uh, make a list, to be able to address them, to resolve them in a Christ-like, humble way. And we know that these conflicts will be resolved only by Philippians 2, 3 to 8, humility application. Because this will allow us to obey all that we promise to do to others around us. And because of that, transformation comes in, transforming us to be pleasing to God, to experience His presence, power, and favor. Let me share with you what this presence of God is that happens to intentional disciples. Jesus promised to be with His disciples always. In verse 20 of Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus said, Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That to me is the greatest promise that any Christian disciple at that would need. And when Jesus is with you, the impossible becomes possible. When we humble ourselves to obey everything that he commands, transformation happens. I used to be a dictator corporate person and I kind of uh, absorbed that when I became a pastor so I became a dictator pastor I know that I am improving but um, I'm not there yet so because of ID I became a servant leader husband instead of a dictator pastor my wife also from a suplada wife to a smiling accommodating wife and me with my children from a father, pastor who knows it all, and hey, come here, I'll solve your problem, um, which of course my children did like, I became a listening friend and father to my children. And because of that, there was honest to goodness transformation. God changed our children to respond to our humility and obedience. Not only that, my, my family, my siblings, God prepared them, God prepared their hearts, um, together with their families to hear the gospel, to be saved and transformed. And let me show you, this is our family Bible study group today, uh, happening in five different locations in the Philippines and the USA. And God has been faithful. It's really amazing. And you know what? That's not all. Um, aside from us, there are many other disciples all around the world today who are experiencing authentic transformation because of the way that God has showed them his enabling presence. And here are two stories that I would like you to listen to, to be encouraged, to be disciples, Christ-like transformed, to worship God at our best.
I'm Jason, and together with me is my wife, Faith, and we are from Bentonville, Arkansas. We'd like to share our intentional discipleship journey with you. I am on a separate video, though, due to being quarantined for a COVID infection. I have been a Christian for more than 20 years. I have volunteered at church. I've done missions overseas and even became a children's pastor. But as a Christian couple, Faith and I found ourselves living in a cycle of self-righteousness and religion with almost no real transformation. After hearing a testimony from CCF's online service, we learned about online discipleship and were immediately engaged by a couple from Florida. We saw our disciples' intentionality in modeling to us what Christ-like humility looked like. Through intentional discipleship, God gave me a vision for my life that is rooted in humility as seen in Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Before, I used to just wake up and go to work to provide for the physical and the financial needs of my family. But now, I learned that my role as a husband and a father is to set the direction of my family toward Christ's likeness. Prayer and the study of God's word are now accompanied by a lifestyle of obedience to him. I started with the little things, like helping my wife with the chores before heading to work. Consequently, our eldest, a four-year-old girl, is now more helpful with the chores and taking care of her little sisters. When I'm at fault, I ask for forgiveness. I'm intentionally modeling asking for and giving forgiveness, and this practice has helped my children to easily ask and give forgiveness as well. Walking in Christ-likeness daily is not easy. More conflicts arise, but they become opportunities for us to model humility to one another. Instead of giving him the silent treatment, I learn to respond to Jason with more grace and compassion when he makes mistakes. I also understood that next to God, my husband is my priority, even before my kids, expressing it through little things like preparing his coffee first thing in the morning and asking him simple questions like, how can I help you? more often. I also learn to be more prayerful, especially when disappointments with him and my kids arise. I noticed that the kids would start doing the same thing, praying heartfelt prayers for their daddy. But it didn't stop there. God also gave me the opportunity to model humility by asking for forgiveness from my youngest sister and reconciling with my father-in-law, whom I harbored bitterness through many years of hurt and judgment. Regarding others as more important, according to Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, doesn't stop at home. We learn to reach out to others, even if it's uncomfortable and countercultural, especially here in the U.S. where Christianity has become trivial. When we hosted a stranger in our home for an event, we took the initiative in showing her the love of Jesus by treating her like family. She appreciated our kindness, and this paved the way for us to build a relationship with her to continue modeling Christ's likeness. God has also sent us couples with multicultural backgrounds to disciple and journey with. As a family, we have realized that we've experienced more joy, peace, and harmony by walking in God's purpose. Please pray for our family to persevere in intentional discipleship and also for me to recover from COVID. I am Jason Reynolds, once a passive husband and father, now proactive in displaying Christ's likeness in the home first and beyond. I am Faith Reynolds. To, to Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ be all, be all glory, glory and honor, honor and, and praise. praise. Hello everyone, my name is Flavi Ann. I was 10 years old when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Since then, I consistently attended Sunday services and got involved in various ministries. My parents had been OFWs for a long time. It was just me and my brother left living in Manila on our own. In 2012, our whole family migrated to Canada, hoping that we would make up the years we lost when we were separated from each other. Being used to living life in Manila independently, it was challenging for me to adjust living with my parents during our early years in Canada. It was especially hard getting along with my dad. We disagree on almost everything, making it impossible for me to obey him. I became successful in my career, and I became so proud and thought that I knew life better than my parents. Our chaotic family relationship grew more and more miserable when I entered into a relationship that my dad was totally against. 
The more my dad showed his disapproval toward the guy, the more I rebelled and fought for our relationship. I continued sinning by disobeying my parents until it took a toll on our family relationship. Almost every day, we fight. I can't remember a night where there was peace at home. Sadly, it also caused my parents to be in constant argument with each other, risking their own marriage. But God was so gracious and loving despite of my stubbornness. I was invited by a friend to CCF Edmonton, and it was the start of my spiritual transformation. I started attending the B1G Singles Group and eventually committed myself to intentional discipleship. God changed my heart, and I finally understood His words that my purpose in life is to be like Christ, selfless, humble, and obedient to the point of death, according to Philippians 2, 3-8. Through discipleship, my pride was exposed. With constant encouragement and prayers, I finally decided to obey God. As what Ephesians 6, 1-3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. Even though it was hard and painful, I decided to obey my parents and took the courage to break up with my then boyfriend and ended a relationship that was not glorifying to God. I started honoring my parents by considering their feelings as more important than my own. I started respecting them by acknowledging my own mistake and asking for their forgiveness. And God was true to His promise in Ephesians 6, that when I choose to obey and honor my parents, I will enjoy life here on earth. I was able to get along well with my dad, which I thought was impossible to happen. Despite the pandemic, we were able to spend more quality time together as a family by traveling a lot last summer, doing activities together, and a whole lot of bonding time. Our family is far from perfect. We still have petty fights, but thank God, our once chaotic family relationship is now living in harmony, happiness, and peace. I humbly ask that you pray for us. It is my desire that all of us will be walking and growing in our relationship with God. To God be all the glory. Praise God for those testimonies indeed. And you know, because of intentional disciple making, because of us being intentional disciples, God has blessed our ICP population in an amazing way. And let me share with you our ICP global numbers. In Canada, we now have nine satellites and two house churches. In the USA, we're equally growing, four satellites and 10 house churches. And um, in Europe, Europe of all places, we now have two satellites and 10 house churches. And the Middle East, the most vibrant, we have 16 satellites and um, 10 house churches. Or in Asia, outside of the Philippines, we have five satellites and three house churches. And down under, last but not least, we have three satellites and seven house churches. Isn't that amazing? In five years, God has blessed us with these great numbers. Why? Because we are transformed disciples, Christ-like, and it is the best worship that we can ever give God. So to God be all the glory. He transforms us, Christ-like humble, when we make disciples intentionally. Praise God for you, Pastor Danny, Sister Grace, and all of your fellow servant leaders in uh, the International Church Planting Group. And by the way, if you out there have friends and family that you want to connect with our CCF International Satellites, just take a look at what's on the screen and visit ccf.org.ph slash where we are and they will make sure to connect your friend, your family, or even you yourself to one of our international satellites anywhere in the world. So going back to our message today, what is it? Worship Jesus and be transformed. As we come towards the end of our message together, I want to revisit those last few verses we read earlier and just unpack them a little bit more so that you and I can be truly in awe of this Jesus who alone deserves our worship. So let's go back to verse 5. 
Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. When the Lord Jesus Christ took the form of man, he never stopped being God. So he was 100% God, 100% man. But it says in this verse, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he never used his divinity for any selfish advantage. Let me give you an example. Remember that time when Jesus was being arrested and some of his disciples resisted? As a matter of fact, one of them cut off the ear of the slave of the high priest. This is what Jesus said. Put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And then listen to this. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now, that would have been so amazing to see. 12 legions, if you consider a Roman legion, 6,000 soldiers. So that would have been 72,000 angels coming down to rescue Jesus. How awesome that would have been. But Jesus said, I'm not going to do that. And his reason, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus was totally, absolutely committed to his mission, and that is to be your savior and mine. And then it says, he emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. You know, when I come across this phrase, being found in appearance as a man, you and I, we don't really know what Jesus looked like when he was here on earth. But this we know. In the Old Testament, there is a prophetic statement about what happened to his appearance while he was being tortured. And it says here in Isaiah 52, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. What they did to our Lord and Savior Jesus is unthinkable. It is beyond our imagination. But he did it all for you and for me. Let me try and just kind of condense all of this so that we get the whole picture. Jesus was, is, and always will be God. Imagine the implications of that statement. That means that he is the creator and the sustainer of all things. Imagine the wonders of this earth, the majestic mountains, the lush valleys, the depths of the oceans and all that is in them. All of these are his handiwork. Imagine, for example, the, the stars and the galaxies and the planets, the mysteries of this universe. All of these he simply spoke into being. And you, my friend, you are his masterpiece. The Bible says he personally knit you together in your mother's womb. And yet Jesus, the supreme creator and sustainer of all things, the God of gods, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He took the form of man. Now, he could have come as the wealthiest, most powerful man on earth, but that's not what he did. He came as a bond servant. He didn't come as someone who was forced into slavery. He came as someone who completely submitted his will to another. That's what bond servant means. He voluntarily submitted himself to the sovereign will of his father. Remember what Jesus prayed? Father, if you are willing, let this cup pass from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And so he became completely obedient to his father, even to the point of death. Now it could have been a quick death. It could have been 
a dramatic and heroic death. But it was not. It was death on a cross. The most cruel, the most savage, the most shameful death that had ever been created at that time. For what? It was for you and it was for me. And just like that old song says, Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more can he give? Oh, how he loves you and me. Friends, what is the appropriate response to this Jesus? Remember our definition of worship? Let's adopt it to this. Worship is the appropriate response to who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he continues to do. And at the end, after the humiliation of Christ, will surely come the exaltation of Christ. So let's end with these verses. Verse 9 to 11 says, For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. He came to save us and to sacrifice himself for us. But one day Jesus will come back again. And when he does, he will come as the conquering king and the righteous judge of all of the earth. And we are told that on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But you see, on that day, there will be two groups of people who will be bowing the knee and making that confession. The first group of people, they'll be kneeling and bowing and confessing that Jesus is Lord. They'll be doing it with joy. They'll be doing it knowing that they'll be with their Savior in eternity forever from that day forward. And they're bowing with joy because at some point in their lives, they had already given themselves to Jesus to be their Lord and Master and Savior. But there will be those who will bow in shame and regret because they know that at some point in their lives, they had rejected Jesus and they decided instead to live only for themselves. So my question to you, my friend, is which one will you be? Will you be bowing in joy, in bliss, in reverence, or will you be bowing the knee in shame and regret? I pray that this day, this moment, you will bow your heart to Jesus and begin that transformation in your life as you receive him to be your Lord, your master, and your savior. Allow him to come into your life and you begin to worship him from your heart to make him number one in your life every single day. And I promise you, you will never regret that decision because he will change you from the inside out. He will forgive your sins and he will assure you of your eternal destiny. If the Lord has spoken to your heart, and you want to respond that way, and I pray you do, will you pray with me right now? Just say to him, Lord Jesus, I want to thank you today for how you sacrificed yourself for me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I've lived my life for my own purpose up to this day. Lord, I desire a change in my life, and I know that only you can cause that change to happen. I want my life to no longer be about me. I want my life to be about you, a life of worship as you and you alone deserve. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. I give myself completely to you. And I bow my heart and I confess that you and you alone are the Lord and the Savior of my life. Transform me from this day forward to be the person you want me to be 
For your sake, Lord Jesus, and in your name, I pray. Amen and amen. If the Lord has spoken to you through this message, we would love to connect with you. Please look at the link below. Follow the instructions. We would love to have someone chat with you. And if you happen to be with us for the very first time, or you need someone to pray with you, please visit our online welcome center. Yes, we have an online welcome center. If this is your first time with CCF or you want someone to pray with you, please let us minister to you at the online welcome center. Again, a reminder for next Sunday, it'll be a very special service, our anniversary service, a very special message, very special celebration. Invite your friends and your family. Finally, stay tuned for Sunday Fast Track and for the discussion questions that you can share among the members of your family and in your small group. God bless you and stay safe, everyone. All right. Uh, thank you, Pastor Ricky, for your message uh, to continue worship Jesus and be transformed. As we continue to inten intentional discipleship, uh, Jesus has promised that he is with us. Then as we obey everything he commands, then transformation happens. Uh, thank you, Pastor Danny, as well, for encouraging us to practice intentional discipleship and to memorize the scripture. So we want to encourage everybody to memorize uh, uh, Philippians 2, 3 to 8, um, to continue to be humble and selfless and most especially uh, obey God's commands. So let us now read the discussion questions. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, um, question number one, how is your personal worship of Christ? How can you improve in this area? Question number two, what will you do in the coming weeks to tell others about Jesus? And question number three, are you becoming more like Jesus, especially in humility? Um, humbly ask the people around you for honest feedback. So um, before we play some announcement videos, remember to stay because we will be recording a quick video greeting for CCF's anniversary. Okay, so um, I think we're going to play some announcement videos now.
Okay. Uh, we thank God for the technology that we have that we have in being able to worship together with the entire CCF movement all over the world. Let us use the discussion questions provided for us in discipling our family, as some of you are doing right after this worship service, or by discussing them in your D group meetings. However, and whenever you meet, we encourage you to use these guide questions as you focus on applying them in your own lives and the lives of your families and group members. Remember, only applied truth will change lives. Let's pray. Lord, we worship you and you alone. You are our God, our Father, and our Savior. We know in worshiping you more and more, we will be transformed, God. Please create in us a clean heart and help us grow into a person you want us to be, rather than following our own ways. Lord, please purify our heart and hearts and make it more and more like yours. God, please guide our paths and help us take steps that will take us toward your plans. We will obediently follow your will, O oh God. God, please help our church body to talk in a manner worthy of your calling you have given us. Help us in all of your inter all our interactions with one another to a humble and gentle hearts. Grant us patience love for, and love for one another. God, help our church to grow more and more with your love and promise. In Jesus' name we pray.